Want to meet your homebrew heroes? Register now for the 39th Annual National Homebrewers Conference, also known as HomebrewCon, June 15th through 17th in downtown Minneapolis. This year's HomebrewCon features more than 80 speakers, including Charlie Papazian, Annie Johnson, Gordon Strong, Brad Smith, and many more homebrew heavyweights. Register today at homebrewcon.org. homebrewcon.org. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, April 20th, 2017. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, we get back to basics with Chris Colby, editor of Beer and Wine Journal, as we talk about the details of step mashing. If you're new to home brewing or would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. If you buy any of our DVD combos, you get a free basic brewing bottle opener. Don't forget to uh, get a copy of our brewer's logbook. You can use it to log and track up to 50 batches of beer. You can follow me on Twitter. My username is Basic Brewing, all one word. Our Basic Brewing Radio and Basic Brewing Video page is on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. Thanks again to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our BasicBrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us first and click on our associate link on BasicBrewing.com. It won't cost you any extra, but you'll be helping us to bring you this show, and we greatly appreciate your support. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site as well. You can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on iTunes. Our Android app at Amazon.com, we have a, a Windows phone app. We're on the BlackBerry podcast directory. We're on the Stitcher app. We're on Google Play Music. We're on the iHeartRadio app. We're just everywhere. And uh, if you want to put a tip in our tip jar, some virtual coinage in our virtual guitar case, you can go to basicbrewing.com slash support. And thanks to everybody who's done so already. I sampled my uh, small batch extract robust coffee porter last night. It's been in the bottle oh for about a week, I guess. Uh, the carbonation level isn't where I want it to be yet. It's bottle conditioning. Uh, but the coffee flavor and aroma, I'm really happy about. <laughs> uh, for the two-gallon batch, I put uh, 60 grams of cracked coffee beans that I roasted myself uh, into the secondary for five days. And the beans were roasted just past second crack. So they're they're pretty chocolatey and not overly bitter. And... Um, I looked at the the packaging uh, that I got from the uh, the local coffee shop where I get my green beans, and it turned out these are Panamanian beans. So uh, I don't I don't know I can't remember if I've done Panama, Panamanian coffee before, but uh, I love to experiment uh, with coffee beans that are grown in uh, different places in the world. Uh, I keep mentioning or for, meaning to mention this, but I keep forgetting. Uh, but I'm remembering now. <laughs> Marshall shot. And the crew over at uh, Brewlosophy have started a podcast. And uh, I'm sure if it's anywhere as good as the blog, it will be amazing. So be sure to check out the Brewlosophy podcast on your favorite podcast source. And uh, speaking of podcasts, I'm going to uh, post a video episode of our podcast on Friday uh, on a split batch of mead that I made. Uh, I chose to make half plain and uh, sparkling and the other half peach flavored using natural peach flavoring. And uh, I got an email from a listener, Evan, who was curious about how that mead was coming uh, since uh, I mentioned it on the show. And I told him that the plain half needed a little bit of an acid bite, uh, maybe some maybe some acid blend uh, to balance it out. And, and Evan had made some mead himself recently uh, and said that... Uh, he, Evan says, I found mine to be like that, too, so I did another few batches. I found you get a better flavor if you steep tea bags to the water before cooling and adding honey. He says, I used uh, Twining's Earl Grey. Earl Grey, steep. Uh, <laughs> uh, Evan says, I get a way more bolder color and flavor with no distinct tea-like flavor since it ferments out. He says, a darker yellow. Uh, plus, I did another batch with one and a half pounds of blackberries, and that really helped to bring more flavor into it as well. So, very interesting idea. I like the idea of a tea-based mead. And uh, blackberries as well. That sounds tasty, too. Thanks, Evan. 
Uh, now let's talk about our sponsors, uh, Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa. You've heard Steve and me brag about our electric brew in a bag systems from High Gravity, but they also put together more traditional three-tier electric brewing systems. If you go to highgravitybrew.com, the Build Your Own Electric Brewing System feature lets you customize your system to fit your needs. If you don't want to go uh, brew in a bag and you want to go you know, more traditional with a three-tier system, you can do that. High Gravity Systems uh, can brew five gallons all the way up to two barrels and feature the Warthog electric brewery controllers. And uh, there's a variety of Warthog controllers uh, to control your heat and your pumps. And uh, you can pick one of those along with your system that's just right for you. So it, it, go ahead on over to highgravitybrew.com and design your dream system. That's a family-owned and operated and great supporters of Basic Brewing Podcasts, Desiree and Dave of HighGravityBrew.com. Now let's talk to Chris Colby about using step mashing to take more control over the character of your beer. Chris Colby, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Hey, James. Thanks for having me on the show. So is your book subject and title, is it still super secret, or can you talk about it? I can talk about it. It's uh, the name of the book is going to be uh, Methods of Modern Homebrewing, and it's as the title states, it's a, it's a methods book. Uh, <laughs> it's not, not a secret. Uh, yeah, so it basically it, it goes through the basic uh, all the basic techniques for for both extract and all grain brewing, and you know explains the you know the nitty gritty of how do, you, how do you do that in your home brewery? And you're still writing it, but it's on Amazon already? Yeah, the pre-order, I think. The the book is there, at least. I don't know if you can actually pre-order it. But... <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's release date is uh, December, so yeah, no hurry. <laughs> Well, cool. We will, uh, we'll, of course, we'll we'll remind people about that uh, as time goes on. Um, but uh, one of the uh, one of the methods uh, that we uh, that you talk about in the book, or that you will talk about in the book, I'm assuming, is uh, step mashing, and we're going to talk about that today. It's been a while since we talked about step mashing, and I don't think we've dedicated uh, an entire show. Uh, to the subject, you know, we talked about uh, all grain brewing in general, and and I think uh, when the early, early, early episodes, we talked to John Palmer, or I talked to John Palmer, and being the royal we here, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we talked to John Palmer. We talked to John Palmer, <laughs> and we were amused. <laughs> we, it was delightful. <laughs> we, we were impressed, uh, but uh, but it's been a while. You know, st step mashing is one of those things that you look at the process and you think, how did people, you know, back before thermometers and back before people knew what, what enzymes were and, and all this stuff, how the heck did they figure all this stuff out? You know, because it's a it's a complicated process. So, you know, what are your theories on the evolution of uh, <laughs> where step mashing came from? Uh, I really don't have any any thoughts on that. I mean, I I, I would guess it just came out of uh, basically trial and error. You know, there's because there's elements of like decoction mashing that make a little bit of sense. Like they they dough in a lot of times if we're decoction mashing at around 99 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, and that's sort of right around body temperature, and that's kind of an easy, you know, if you especially if you're used to used to it that's kind of an easy temperature to get uh a handle on and then from there you know they would pull a certain part of the mash for this is decoction mashing which is a form of step mashing but they you know they would pull a certain percentage of the mash and boil it and that would raise the temperature to a you know a, they didn't have thermometers so they didn't know but to a certain point and then they do it again and i think just through just through trial and error and, and trying different things, they eventually hit on, you know, things that worked. And of course, the malts were evolving at the same time too. They were, you know, finding out how to, how to malt more efficiently. And so, yeah, I, 
you know, you can make a guess, but I would, you know, I would, I would be anxious to see like some actual, if anyone has done any actual research and can actually find out how they decided, you know, uh, or what the, uh, how step matches evolved. It's all, it's all accidental. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody did something wrong one time, and it worked better, probably. <laughs> Let's keep that. <laughs> That's good. <Yeah. laughs> Write that I mean, down. You, could, you can, in in the absence of evidence, you can make up any number of stories. That, <laughs> uh, as, as we see from modern, you know, let's say politics. But uh, I mean, you could you could imagine that step matching started out by people doing in at you know. Uh, you know, just well water temperature, and then just heating the mash up until the point where it converted, you know, and, uh, you know, from there, the step mash would have just, uh, you know, by trial or error, they found out, hey, if we stopped here for a little while, rather than keeping heating, it worked, uh, you know, I don't know. So I'm what, sure it's interesting. So what's the, what's the, what are the mechanics behind a step mash? I mean, what, what is a step mash and why would you want to do it? Yeah, well, basically, a step mash is one that has uh, one or more uh, ascending uh, steps where you you rest at a certain uh, temperature, then you you, then you go up to to the next higher temperature rest, then you go to the next higher temperature rest, and so basically, any uh, any mash that has more than one temperature rest uh, with as long as you ignore the uh, the mash out uh, is is called a step mash, just because you step from one temperature to the other. And and there's a couple of different reasons why you might want to do it. Um, one is if you're dealing with under modified malt or if you're, or if you've malted your own, uh, you know, malt at home, which some people do, uh, sometimes a step mash is required to, to uh, uh, basically the step mash continues what you start in the malting and breaking down the gums and the, and the proteins and, and things like that. Uh, another thing about step mashes is they produce, uh, compared to a, a single, or most single infusion mashes at least, step mashes produce uh, wort that's a little bit more fermentable. Um, and so you can do a step mash specifically for that. If you want to brew a beer that's uh, with a highly fermentable wort, so it turns out a little drier, a little less sweet, uh, than uh, the average beer, um, a step mash, uh, you can do that by you, you mashing in a little lower than the normal sacrification range at first. Let uh, let some of the alpha or not some of the amylase enzymes work um, before you before you ramp it up to the normal uh, mash rest, and you get a drier beer that way. So you mentioned en- enzymes. And that's what it's all about, right? I mean, these these different enzymes that are uh, that come as a result of the of the uh, the malting process in the grain, they work at different temperatures. So when you rest at their favorite temperatures, they do their work better. Correct? Yeah. Um, all the enzymes, uh, like every enzyme ever, uh, as you increase in temperature, they work uh, faster and faster. But given that enzymes are uh, – they're proteins, they're long strings of amino acids that are sort of um, folded back on each other, bunched up. But there's a, a certain temperature at which the, the molecule just uh, unravels, which is – or denatures in, in molecular biology. Um, so basically the activity curve of any enzyme is that it starts out you know, low, and as you increase the temperature, it gets – it works you know, faster and faster and faster. But then you get to a point where – uh, it's it's working faster, but it's also being na- denatured, and you go a little bit farther, and then it's all denatured. So the uh, when you when you read at brewing, they'll they'll give a range of temperatures that the enzyme works at. That's basically the range right before the uh, right before the uh, enzyme denatures. You know, it's the it's the hottest you can get it where the enzyme is still holding together and working, and uh, so. And, and I think that causes a little bit of confusion among people who don't know anything about molecular biology because, like, below that temperature, all any enzyme is is still working. You know, if it's if its range is higher, you know, in the literature, 
it's still working at those lower temperatures, just much more slowly. Mm -hmm. um, and then also when you exceed those temperatures, it takes a while for uh, enzymes to denature. So it's not like if the range of something is up to, you know, 140, you know, it's not like, move, you know, boost the temperature to 141 and enzyme activity just stops dead. No, it's, you know, that's when it, you know, uh, the denaturation starts to accelerate and, and different, different enzymes take longer to deactivate. And so it's, uh, the, the enzyme, uh, optimum temperature ranges are basically a way of neatening up a very sloppy system. <laughs> it makes it, <laughs> It makes it look all orderly because you say it's active here, it's active here, but really it's they're they're always active at, at to some degree until they've been completely denatured, which they may or may not be during the course of your brew day, depending on which enzyme you're talking about. So when uh, when uh, we first got into all grain brewing, um, you know, more than a decade ago or whatever, that this you know step mashing. Uh, it seemed like more of a thing. Uh, and nowadays, uh, at least around the stuff that I read and, and the recipes and such, step mashing, I don't see mentioned very much. So is it less necessary than than uh, than it used to be? I mean, uh, a single, infu single temperature mash uh, it seems to be doing the trick nowadays. Yeah, well, I think um, modern malts and, and, you know, since before we started brewing, uh, you know, modern malts are, are designed for a single infusion mash. You know, most, almost any malt you buy, unless it specifically says under modified or less modified, uh, you know, it's a fully modified malt and the maltster has, de has designed it to be used in a, in a single infusion mash. I think in the early days of brewing, people found out about all the enzymes. It sounded scientific. You know, there's this idea that if you're doing more, you're, making things better. And so people went nuts with all sorts of crazy step mashes. And, you know, um, I think people gradually, brewers gradually came to realize that a lot of times less can be more, especially when, when you understand that mashing is an extension of malting. And if malting has basically improved so that it, it takes care of a lot of the problems that mashing used to have to solve. Yeah. You, uh, you don't for that you know almost all malts you use you do not need a step mash you know if it's an under modified malt then yeah it does um but if it's a fully modified malt you can there's a couple different step mashes you can do that, that aren't isn't harming anything you know one's just aimed at, at increasing fermentability but it, it's also not necessary yeah is is there an instance where you could be doing more harm than good if you go to the extra time and, and energy to, to do a step mash? Oh, easily. Uh, the, the biggest problem can be if you do uh, excessively long rests in uh, the region uh, that they used to call it the protein rest. Uh, but basically, you if you rest in that region, you can degrade uh, – you know, a fair amount of the proteins that, that actually deal with uh, head formation and retention. Uh, and so you can, um, you know, uh, arrest in uh, in that, in, in you know, the, the traditional protein rest region uh, can, can definitely negatively impact your foam. So let's talk about the, the, the rests themselves. What, what are the, uh, and, and you, with the step mash, you can design your step mash where you can pick, pick and choose these things. You don't have to use all of them. You can just use, you know, one or two uh, of the of these uh, particular temperature stops. So it's not an all in one, or all or nothing uh, kind of a kind of a thing. So what are the what are the steps in a step mash? What are the traditional temperature levels, and and what do they do? Okay, if we uh, if we like tiptoe through like every possible. Uh, uh, step there's a one of them that almost nobody uses anymore uh, uh, was was a traditional uh, rest in uh, lager brewing and that was just called doughing in and um, they would this was basically just wetting the malt sometimes the, the the mash would be mashed in at basically with just well water so um, 
and then it would be heated to you know right around 100 Fahrenheit and really all that step was doing was uh, letting the, the mash uh, letting the grains take on water Okay, these days with modern malts, there's really absolutely no reason for that, um, you know, unless you're absolutely trying to eke out one, you know, half of one extra uh, point of extraction efficiency or whatever. So uh, um, just mashing in at, at sort of your ambient water temperature was just called doughing in. Uh, the next highest rest would be um, called the acid rest, and at this enzyme, or at this temperature range uh which is uh, between 30 and 53 celsius or uh 86 and 128 fahrenheit i think and most often it was right around 95 degrees fahrenheit which is 35 degrees c anyway at, at this at this temperature an enzyme called phytase is uh active and it will lower the ph of the mash um the problem with this in in most modern fully malt modified malts, uh, the enzyme phytase has been uh, destroyed in the kilning. It's um, it's only present in malts that are uh, have very very low amount of kilning, uh, you know, under modified malts, and also it takes like a long time. So if you if you mash in and you're waiting for the your mash pH to fall via an acid rest, even if you're using uh, an under modified malt, it takes a long time. So most people these days, unless you're trying to brew a very historical, uh, you know, in a, in a historical fashion, most people aren't going to bother. You're just going to, you know, adjust your water chemistry and or add some uh, sour malt or add, you know, acid directly. Um, so uh, that's the second rest. Uh, the third, there's a rest that you would only ever do if you were making a German wheat beer, and that comes in right at about 109 to 113, which is, is right around 45 degrees C, and that's a, called the ferulic acid rest. Okay, uh, both uh, barley malt and wheat malt have uh, an acid in it called ferulic acid. Uh, barley malt actually has more. Uh, some people think because it's associated with wheat beers that wheat has more, but barley actually has slightly more. Hmm. But any, anyway, uh, if you rest at this temperature, uh, ferulic acid, which is bound, uh, I forget how, it's attached somehow to, to molecules in the grain, gets released. And then when the, uh, if that word is fermented with a, a typical German wheat beer yeast, uh, those strains convert the ferulic acid into four vinyl guaiacol. Which you perceive as a clovey, you know. Uh, German wheat beers have that, you know. There's the balance between the banana and the clove, mm -hmm. is the way a lot of people describe it. And the a ferulic acid rest brings out more ferulic acid, which then gets turned into more uh, for VG, which uh, you know that makes a more clovey beer. So that's a rest that you would only ever do if you were going to ferment the beer with a, a German wheat beer yeast and you wanted more clove. Um, next, there's sort of a, I don't know, a variety of rests that fall within, within the range of anywhere from about a hundred Fahrenheit to, to 131. And these are the beta glucan and protein rests. Um, beta glucan rest is usually around 104 to 113 Fahrenheit, 40 to 45 C. And what, what a beta glucan rest does is it breaks down uh, any gums that are left in the malt, and again with a, with a modern fully modified malt, you, you, it's not needed. But if you're using a high amount of uh, uh, like rye or wheat or something that that is gummy, um, then a, then a beta glucan rest might be a good thing. Um, and then there's the above that the protein rests, which are sometimes broken down into a pepsidase rest, which is around uh, 45C or, or 113 Fahrenheit, and then a protease rest, which, uh, you know, just two different ways the proteins are being attacked. And that would be more at 55C uh, or 131 Fahrenheit. And those are, you know, traditionally the range where, where proteins got degraded so that the beer didn't end up 
uh, overly cloudy. And again, the, the only reason you would rest there these days is if you're using under modified malt that required a rest there. Hmm. Cause in fully modified malts, uh, if you rest there, um, uh, especially in, in the higher half of that range, uh, you're going to be killing your foam. So that's the what? One, two, three, four. That was a fifth. Sort of depends on how you count them. <laughs> <laughs> and some, some people just say protein rest and other people break it into the two different peptidase and protease uh, rest. So anyway, um, the next rest can occur as, as low as 131 degrees Fahrenheit and up to about 145, but it's usually right around 140 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, which is 60 degrees C. And that's uh, sometimes called a beta rest or a beta amylase rest. And this is right in, at least pretty close to the uh, optimal range for beta amylase, which is one of the two amylase enzymes that degrades starch. And the idea with a beta rest is that if you want a dry beer, you can rest for a while there before boosting the temperature up into the range where alpha and beta are working together. And because alpha uh, is relatively stable uh, uh, in heat compared to beta, you know, the lower rest gives beta amylase a long time to work before you're raising it up into the typical uh, range for, you know, single infusion mash at which both alpha and beta are working together, but beta amylase is at that range, it's, it's already starting to be denatured and, and lose its ground. Um, for instance, I, I happen to know, not that not that this is a homebrew favorite to try to clone, but uh, Bud Light is brewed by, they have a two-hour rest at 140. God. They start they start out their mash there and then, and then raise it. Yeah, so it's, uh, uh, you know, if you're making something that's very, very dry, uh, you know, a, a long rest at 140 will, will help. And even if you want to just, uh, if you've got a, a beer you normally make with a fully modified malt, um, and you just want to dry it out a little, like a 15 minute rest at 140, and that before boosting it up to like you know 152 or what, whatever your whatever rest you want, it will do you know enough to make a difference. So if you're um, making say a big double IPA or something, and you don't want it to be uh, s- sweet. Uh, one one way is you can, well, one way is you can add sugar, uh, but yep. another way is you can spend some time at this uh, at this beta rest to dry it out. Yeah, start at uh, mash in at like one forty to one forty five anywhere in there, and give it a little bit of time. Even fifteen twenty minutes is is going to do uh, do something. And maybe and then, also a big a big Belgian beer that you. You know, like a, a triple or, a, you know, a big golden ale that you want to be nice and and uh, high in alcohol but uh, but dry at the same time. Yeah, sure. Any any beer you want to dry out, it, it, it works well. And then the next rest, if you go strictly by enzyme activity, would be alpha amylase. And that's at uh, 158 to 162, uh, basically 70 to 72 C. And that's sort of at the optimal for alpha amylase. Obviously, most single infusion mashes, you are you know, are basically at between 148 and 162 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's because in a single infusion mash, you're, uh, you're mashing in over the optimal rest for, for beta amylase, but slightly below alpha. And you're basically uh, counting on both of those two to work together. You know, the, the beta will get enough activity in before it's denatured and then the alpha will, will, you know, just keep uh, chugging along, even though it's slightly below, you know, it's, it's optimal. So traditionally, how much time do you have to spend uh, at these rest temperatures uh, to do the trick, to, to, to produce the effect that you want? Say if I'm doing a, uh, like a wheat beer, you know, a German clovey wheat beer, uh, how long do I have to stay down, you know, at, uh, at the, um, uh, the ferulic acid t- uh, rest uh, to get the effect I want. Um, for all of these, you, um, it helps to think about, you know, when you start the mash, you have everything in, in it at, at relatively all all the starting, you know, molecules, all the starch, all the uh, you know, the ferulic acid bound or whatever it's bound to, 
And the NSAC activity is greatest at first, you know, because there's more substrate to work on. And over time, they, the enzyme activity decreases, uh, you know, both even if it's even if the enzyme itself is not being denatured, it's simply, you know, if amylase enzymes are working, say, just over time, there, there's less starch for them to work on when they've done their job. So uh, a lot of times a short rest and all these do do quite well, you know, 15 minutes, uh, you know, certainly for a ferulic acid rest, 15, 20 minutes, uh, a lot, you know, beta glucan rest, you don't need much more than that. Uh, I guess the, the phytase, the acid rest, those could go on and on and on because those took forever. And doing in, people used to, you know, you leave that for uh, just basically however long you felt like it. Um, and then, you know, for in terms of the amylase enzymes and, and single infusion mashing, uh, it really depends on the diastatic power of the malt if you use you know there are some english you know two row pale ale malts that are relatively you know relatively dark maybe around three degrees love a bond uh and you might you know you might need to mash them 45 minutes to 60 minutes to get a negative iodine test mm. but w- with some with some u.s you know pale malts you might get a negative iodine test uh, immediately after mashing in you know, it might, or as, as soon as five minutes. Hmm. Um, so, the uh, I mean, the nice thing about, uh, nice thing, of course, about the uh, amylase enzymes is you have a test to figure out if they're if they're finished. You know, the uh, you do the iodine test. Whereas for these other rests, like you know, for ferulic acid rest, you you don't really. There's no simple way to tell if you've released any ferulic acid. Likewise, the uh, the beta glucan. I mean, maybe if you had some sort of device that tested uh, viscosity in the wort, you could figure it out. But there's no really simple way for that. Uh, acid rest, there is obviously pH meter will tell you if your acid rest is working. But uh, yeah, in terms of, I mean, luckily most recipes specify the length of time that you spend at these things, and if if, if the brewer just keeps in mind that enzyme activity is always highest you know when you when you first mesh in simply because of substrate availability uh then it then it helps you know that like you don't always need you, you don't always need an excessively long rest in any of these things and that the uh whatever the enzyme is doing it's doing it at a decreasing rate as time goes on and i guess we should specify that uh, the iodine test is you take a like a ceramic plate and and uh, collect a little bit of uh, wort on there and and drop some uh, iodine in it and if it doesn't change uh, colors then you're good to go. If it changes into uh, like a, a dark purple or a black color, then that indicates that there's starch still present in the wort and you still got some some sugars to make uh, in your mash. Uh, and then you dispose of the iodine properly away from. <laughs> From whatever you're going to drink, <laughs> yeah, you don't you don't want to don't yeah, pour, you, don't pour that back don't. in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I know people wouldn't, but you know, I'm I'm cautious. Um, so so, what is a mash out, and is it necessary? Yeah, a mash out would be the final rest, with the, which there's no real enzyme associated with it. The idea is just you. Um, you boost the temperature one final time, usually at around 168 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's uh, what 76 to 77 degrees centigrade uh, or Celsius. And, and the basic idea is there is you just uh, you lower the viscosity of the wort a little bit, and that helps somewhat with uh, loudering. It's one of those it's one of those things you you don't really need it. And a lot of homebrewers skip it, especially if you're if you're mashing in a picnic cooler, and so you, you can't directly heat it. Uh, a lot of times, the amount of you know if you've if you're brewing a a batch where the mash tun is almost full, the amount of boiling water you would need to add to raise it to mash out temperature is is you know enough that you would be overflowing the, the mash tun. And so a lot of people just skip it, mm-hmm. and that's uh you know it's really the only consequence there is. Uh, you it may be very very slightly less easy to louder but probably not you know if you 
under, under normal circumstances with a normal grist, it's probably not even going to be noticeable. And if you're worried about it and, and you're, you know, continuously sparging, just sparge with really hot water, like 190 or so, and uh, you'll, you'll eventually raise the temperature up to 170. And then, uh, you know, from there on out, cool down your cool down your sparge water to like 168 to 170 and and yep. just make sure you don't exceed that right at the very end is the only really important time to worry about your sparge water temperature yeah when i was first all grain brewing i was doing it you know in a rubber made cooler and and uh you know when, thinking that it was really important to raise the the temperature of the mash up to that mash out temperature thinking that you know if i let those enzymes work too long on that uh on that wort that it was going to make my beer thin, you know, and it was going to really decrease the quality of the beer, um, you know. But we're talking about just a you know a fairly short period of time there, so uh, you know it's not like anything ruinous is going to happen in those few minutes that you're that you're running your wort out. So so how back in the day, uh, you know, when I did the Rubbermaid cooler. Uh, a picnic cooler thing, or the or the um, you know ten gallon drinking water cooler, uh, to get from one mash rest temperature to the next, I had to add boiling water to the uh, mash tun, uh, you know, and had to calculate the uh, you know use a, a strike water calculator to to figure out how much to add and and all that, and it was really kind of a kind of a pain, you know, because I had to have uh, you know a, a small kettle heating up boiling water at certain times and you know trying to time that with my rat mash rest time and all that it was it was kind of a pain in the butt um so that's kind of like the the nowadays kind of stone age way to do um step mashes um but there there are lots handier ways to do it now yeah um you there, there's essentially two ways to approach a step match. One is if you, you know, if you're using a picnic cooler or whatever, you're you're forced to do it by uh, hot water infusions. So, you know, in that case of a step match, you would mash in thick, you know, um, and then add water at the various, you know, stir in boiling water at the various stages to raise the temperature. Uh, the other way is to add direct heat, and you know, either you need either need a mash tun that, that you can directly heat, you know, like one made out of a, 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 you know, big stainless steel pot or something. Or even if you're using a picnic cooler, you can always do the mash in your kettle and then just scoop it over afterwards. Mm. And in the in the, that case, you're going to want to mash in relatively thin because when you add heat, you're going to want to stir consistently. So, um, yeah, there's, there's two ways of... Uh, boosting the temperature in a step mash and you can you can also combine them you know you can mash in thick do one water infusion for the first step and then heat it for the next you know there's a endless amount of potential permutations uh and it just really comes down to if if you're you know if you have a certain malt or a certain reason that you're going to do a step mash uh then you, all you got to do is just look at your equipment and see like how can I pull this off? You know, if you, <laughs> if you have an infinitely huge mash tun, then yeah, boiling water, you know, that, that raises the temperature instantly, you know, no fuss, no muss. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't, uh, the heating works very well. You know, you just keep your thermometer in there as you stir when you get, you know, within a, within a degree or two, you know, sort of cut the burner off and stir. And usually the, the last little bit of heat that's been, you know, applied to the metal will soak in and bring you up to that temperature. And if you have a fancy, uh, you know, electric uh, brew in a bag system like <clears throat> like I do, uh, <laughs> as long as you you make sure that the, you know, that the bag doesn't scorch uh, and melt, uh, you know, you can just dial in the temperature and, and, uh, and, you know, let the heating element bring you up to the next level. Um, and you know, just brewing a bag in general. As long as you keep the bag off the off the bottom of the uh, of your of your kettle, you know, it should be fairly straightforward to uh, to raise the temperature of your mash uh, to the next level. And I think you know, stirring is probably a really good idea uh, to make sure that uh, you know the 
that the whole thing heats evenly uh, and that you're able to take an accurate uh, temperature reading. Yeah. And uh, also, like, I mean, a few years ago, uh, RIMS and HERMS systems used to be very popular. And those had, you know, the uh, the mash tun with the external heating loop. And you could uh, program those or use them manually to raise uh, step mash temperatures. Sure. So it's a so there 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 is it's more obscure than it used to be, but there are reasons to do uh, step mashes, um, and uh, I take it in your in your book that you'll have some some examples and and recipes uh, with with which to use a step mash. Yeah, I mean, I would say the the biggest uses of a step mash are are one if you want to make a drier beer, you know, just start off with a rest at around one hundred and forty. Uh, dry out your beer a little bit. Another might be called a, like a gum breaker mash. If you've got a lot of rye or a lot of wheat and, and you're, you know, uh, if you've tried that recipe before and had problem laudering, uh, mash it at about 40 C, which is 104, uh, rest there for 10 to 20 minutes and then, you know, jump up to your, uh, you know, the set clarification rest. Uh, and then, you know, Obviously, the classic is if you're using undermodified malt or if you've made malt at home, uh, you know, unless you're very, very good at it, it's likely to be undermodified. Uh, and then, you know, full on, uh, you know, one that stops at uh, protein rest and, uh, you know, maybe low in the, uh, uh, in the beta range and then up to the uh, alpha am- amylase range. It's a fun thing to do if you've never done it. I mean, <laughs> it's kind of like decoction, uh, which is another form of uh, step mashing, essentially. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's fun to do uh, just to say that you've done it and to kind of experience uh, an, another technique. Um, and you might you might like it. You might find out that the that the beer that you get from it uh, is better than the than the you know what you've been doing. So you know, it's worth it worth a shot. Sure, and you can even do. I mean, the, the, the simplest, like, laziest step mash possible is just dough in it at basically any low temperature uh, and then just heat the mash slowly and stand there and stir it until you reach, you know, 152 or wh- wherever you want in the sac clarification range. Mm-hmm. You know, and you just, just sort of, uh, yeah, you just sort of loop through all the uh, all the steps, you know, briefly and because, you know, like I said, the enzymes are work over a broad range and uh, that that works, you know, with under modified uh, malt as well. Cool. Well, all right, sir. I appreciate it. Uh, we will uh, we'll check back with you later um, uh, to, to see how the book is coming. And uh, in the meantime, you know, you can search for it on Amazon and, you know. Is there? I don't guess there's a cover picture yet. I think there's a mock-up. I, uh, <laughs> is the the actual cover picture? No, because the because uh, it the doesn't font. exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless they're really good at uh, predicting what their what their books are going to look like. All right, Chris. Well, I appreciate it. Get back to work on that book. I will do that. Well, thanks again to Chris. I love talking about the details, the technical details of brewing. Um, It's what I love about the hobby. You can go as simple or as complex as you want. And uh, at the end, you get great beer that you like. And you, you know, you brew it your own darn way. (laughs) If you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our support link where you can throw a couple of bucks into the tip jar by subscribing financially to our podcasts. Be sure to check out our DVDs, Extract Brewing and Partial Mashing, Stepping into All Grain, Low-Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits. You can find them all on our site. You get a free Basic Brewing bottle opener with any DVD combo. You can check out our Basic Brewing shirts in the store, too. You can find our log books where you can track and log up to 50 batches of beer. Check all of that out at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continued to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Wabash Valley Farms Whirly Pop Stovetop Popcorn Popper. 
and Fisker's Big Grip Trowel. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We greatly appreciate your support. And don't forget, you can also join the American Homebrewers Association and subscribe to Brew Your Own Magazine through the associate links on BasicBrewing.com. That's all until next time. Till then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long. So long.